Good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Nell Pepper. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Perry Zern and Danny Bassett presenting their new book, Curious Minds, The Power of Connection in Conversation with Christy Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us virtually today. Harvard Bookstore's virtual event series continues alongside our in-person programming, bringing authors and their work to our community, both digitally and in Cambridge. Please check out the full event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for our updates and browse our bookshelves from wherever you may be. Uh, today's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk, you can click on the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many questions as time allows. Uh, also, this event has closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom that you are using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. Also in our chat, I will be posting a link to purchase copies of Curious Minds from Harvard.com. Your purchases make events like this one possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Cambridge in Harvard Square. So we thank you so much for continuing to uh, show up and tune in, especially after these very unusual uh, couple and a half years and supporting both our authors and the fantastic staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Likely as, or uh, rather lastly, as you likely have experienced in virtual gatherings like these, technical issues may arise. Of course, we hope that they do not, but if they do happen, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am delighted to introduce our speakers. Danny Bassett is the J. Peter Skirkanich Professor at the University of Pennsylvania with appointments in the departments of bioengineering, electrical and systems engineering, physics and astronomy, neurology, and psychiatry. Bassett is most well known for blending neural and systems engineering to identify fundamental mechanisms of cognition and disease in human brain networks. Their work has been supported by institutions including the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Perry Zern is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at American University and Affiliate Faculty in the Department of Critical Race, Gender, and Culture Studies. He researches in political philosophy, critical theory, and trans philosophy with special expertise in feminist philosophy, philosophies of resistance, and network theory. Zern is the author of Curiosity and Power, The Politics of Inquiry. And Christy Johnson is a physicist, neuroscientist, and engineer whose research centers around individuals with complex neurodevelopmental dif uh, differences, including rare genetic disorders, autism, and absent or limited spoken speech. While pursuing her doctorate at MIT, Johnson was twice named an MIT Hugh Hampton Young Fellow and three times named an MIT Media Lab Learning Innovation Fellow for her transdisciplinary research. She is currently a Rosamond Stone Zander Translational Neuroscience Center Postdoctoral Fellow at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And today they will be discussing Danny Bassett and Perry Zern's new book, Curious Minds, The Power of Connection. This genre blending book posits that curiosity is not simply a game of intellectual hide and seek, but is also a practice of connection. It connects ideas into networks of knowledge and it connects knowers themselves, both to the knowledge they seek and to each other. I am very pleased to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Danny Bassett, Perry Zern and Christy Johnson. Thank you so much, Nell. That was an amazing introduction. And I am so excited to be here with Dr. Perry Zern and Dr. Danny Bassett, authors of this book. Um, and this book, whew, it is, what an amazing journey. This book is like an everlasting gobstopper. Like every <laughs> section is a new explosion of flavor. The words are luscious and, and every chapter is like, like its own meal. And uh, you got to take a walk. You got to take a walk between each one, both literally and figuratively, which we will get into. Um, so we have a lot to cover today, but right out of the gate, right here, first page, the dedication to all the children who question 
whether it needs to be this way. 13 pages into the book and my head and my heart are already reeling. So you gotta tell me, who did you write the book for? Did you write it for your childhood selves? <laughs> I was going to say, in the sense we wrote it for ourselves, we wrote back to ourselves. I do think that that is true. Um, we were we were the children who asked, does it have to be this way? And we're told, yes, it does, uh, but didn't 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 really believe that. And I think we're we're so grateful to have kind of leaned into that disbelief and, and, and allowed our curiosity to move in places that it was not permitted at that time. Denny? Yeah, and maybe just then also for all of the other children who we know are like we were um, and are also questioning uh, whether it needs to be this way. And maybe it's also to all the children in us as adults who are questioning whether it needs to be this way. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it is, the answer is yes. And uh, there are additional um, groups of individuals that, that fit that, that description too. Yeah, it's such a powerful start to the book. And, and another line that hit me right from the beginning is when you talk about the dissonance between the sort of openness of your upbringing, your mother teaching you to, you know, figure out what you want to know and figure out how to learn it, which is like the best mantra ever. And juxtaposing that with the expectation that you were to conform to a very predetermined future about what you could be and what you could do. And, and I just, I love your response to that in the book, which was, why? You gave us spades, we plan to dig. And and you definitely did. This is this is a big dig. And it is uh, a beautiful, like sort of honestly, it's like a meandering walk through a curio shop of your mind. And I use that mind or that your to mean both singular and plural because, like the inside of the cover says, this book is the thought of one mind and two bodies. And Perry, you are a cross-disciplinary philosopher. And Danny, you are a multidisciplinary physicist and neuroscientist, among many other things. So what was it like to write this book together? Walk us through that process. Yeah, well, it really started when we were, I was in um, grad school. I was finishing up my PhD and writing a, a dissertation on the philosophy of curiosity. And Danny was in a postdoc. Um, just uh, innovating around the, the flexibility of, of of brain network structures and the ways in which the flexibility of our of our brains um, allows for learning to occur. And at some point, I'm sure it was over some kind of family meal or get together. Um, we just started chatting and thought there's some real resonances between the stuff we're working on, despite we are in vastly different fields. Um, and it was just that germ of something that that got us started. But then the real idea of the book, uh, Danny, I don't know if you want to like how we actually came to write it or um, that process. Yeah, so we definitely knew that we could communicate. We had found a scholarly language that we shared, which was this intersection between the philosophy of curiosity and the neuroscience of the mind. Um, and so we started talking uh, and then developed a proposal for the book um, uh, and decided to work with MIT Press for it. But it took then, you know, five or six years and 23 research articles that we wrote together to really flesh out the intersections between our fields and to um, clarify, I think, the contributions that we thought were, were critical at that intersection. Um, and so what you see in the book is the culmination of those years of working together in, in a scholarly way. Um, and I think that I guess another answer to your question, that's the answer in the intellectual sense. Um, but there was also an interesting um, stylistic integration that occurred over the course of those years. So initially, um, you know, when when I was a postdoc and, and Perry was a postdoc, we wrote in very different ways, right? So a philosopher writes very differently <laughs> typically than a scientist does. Um, we're trained to communicate in very precise forms uh, and they're very different forms. But in the in the in our work, both in writing these scholarly articles and then in writing the book, we came to realize that there's a, there's a stylistic integration that can occur 
that allows for us to communicate the ideas about curiosity in a very curious way. So we illustrate um, a lot of the key features of curiosity in the way that we write the book. So the book is not written as a scientist would write. It's not written necessarily as a, as a typical philosophy um, article. It is written to evince the kind of curiosity that we're talking about. Yeah, I'm only laughing because one of the notes that I wrote down uh, while I was reading it was that this book was was fractal curiosity. It was like a book about curiosity that was written as a journey of curiosity that was written, you know, like just the deeper you go, every every layer is its own new exploration of curiosity. It was uh, I think that should be the title of your next book. Um, but and you say you wrote different chapters, but but while I was reading, I actually like I, I remember starting chapter six and it's like Euler's bridge problem, which, you know, classic mathematical like graph theory thing. And I was like, wait, what? I thought I thought they said Perry wrote the even ones. And in fact, I think you did write the even ones. But there was just there was no limit to where one person's voice and idea and expertise stopped and, and another began. Um, and did you have to work at that at all? Or did it just just, just like it evolved and it organically became like one thing did you know all these things before? like did, did you know each other's expertise before you started or you build it up sorry that's the second question but I'm I'm also curious about that yeah we definitely it, it, this was something that we stumbled into in some ways um there was a lot of information in each other's fields that we were discovering so on, on the one hand we decided you know we have something to say in this book let's say it but also as we're writing it as with any book that you're writing if you're really honest about the process you're learning all kinds of things and you're you're figuring out what you actually want to say while doing it. And we discovered so many resonances between our fields and so many ways we can pull those things in. And um, I don't think that we I mean, we did eventually sort of revise each other's chapters and say, you know, we could pull in this here. We could pull in that there. Here's a nice resonance here. To, here's a thread to pull through all of these. Um, we did that kind of work secondarily. But but there's, it was just that years of talking and kind of sharing articles and books and kind of perspectives that, I don't know, it just all started to come together. Yeah, I think we also have the benefit of very similar minds. So the coming together was not as hard as it might be for uh, two other any two um co-authors yeah you'd spend you'd spend some few years but like talking few. together right. before you even started on the book I, yeah that, that's obvious but it's it is really it's just a fun it's a, just a conversation you know it's this fun like journey um and okay so be before we get too far into the journey though there are some sort of nuts and bolts that you really describe and one of which is like different types of curiosity and you you also describe different ways of measuring curiosity and how curiosity manifests in society and education in the brain and we'll get to that i don't i don't want anybody to think we're going to stick here but um can you tell us those three main styles of of human curiosity and how you landed upon them yeah sure so um i was thinking of, you know in philosophy one of the things we like to do is try to define concepts that we take for granted that we understand xyz and then philosophers say well but do we really and let's redefine it and let's really get clear about what we mean with this word uh so i was trying to do that with curiosity which i do think is way more complicated than we expect and we throw the word around i don't think most of us know what we're saying when we say it um we still might not know what we're saying when we say it in some respects. Um, but so I was trying to define curiosity and it was really, really, really frustrating as an enterprise. And I thought, you know what, let's let's start to describe curiosity. Let's talk about what it does rather than what it is, because I think that gives us a really different handle on curiosity itself. So I went back through the history of Western intellectual thought, which is where I'm trained, um, and I kept seeing specific types of curiosity kind of showing up, ways in which curiosity behaves. The first one is the busybody, which is somebody who loves to know a lot about just anything, right? Tell me anything, take my mind anywhere, I'm ready, I have a million tabs open, etc. Um, then there's the hunter who is would be super stressed out by all the tabs and likes to really focus um, on one or two things in particular and know a lot about them. And then the third style is the dancer who is someone who's really creative and imaginative about how they pursue uh, their curiosities and bring together unexpected fields, ideas, perceptions, experiences, etc. So those are the three types. And I know it's yeah. sort of an obvious next question, but, you know, inquiring minds want to know, like, which one are you two? What do you embody? Jenny? Yeah, um, I think it depends. <clears throat> so I think that in my um, 
in my personal, my reading for pleasure, I think I'm definitely a busybody. Um, I have many different kinds of books that I'm in the middle of, uh, and they're there's really no relationship between any of them. Uh, so I think that I'm a busybody there, but then I think in the context of um, scientific research, I tend to be more of, of the hunter. But I would also say that, so that's just to mention that I think that each of us could have different styles that we display in different parts of our lives or in different um, contexts. The second thing I think I'd like to say is that there are it is possible to move from one style to another in the course of um, of a uh, investigation or a process that we are uh, invested in. So in a scientific research project, for example, you might start being more of a busybody and gathering information from disparate sources before you sort of land on the key question that you want to track. So then you turn into the hunter and you track down answers to that question in kind of a line. And then eventually, after you've gathered a series of discoveries, then you become more of the dancer to sort of imagine how that series of discoveries could change how we think about the field or a related field or connect to society or alter um, another uh, uh, practice or change a method, you know. Um, so I think that there's, there's a, it is possible for us to have different styles of curiosity in different contexts. It's also possible for us to use them in series too. Um, and maybe I also just want to add that I want to contrast sort of Perry's use of this historical philosophical approach to uncover or excavate the three styles of curiosity that he found in the Western intellectual tradition. And then what we did as a follow-up in collaboration with David Lydon Staley, who's a communications professor at Penn, was to investigate whether those same styles of curiosity are present today while people browse Wikipedia. So that required a whole different set of methods that are more typical in science. Yeah, and I just love the way you you define these both by intellectual thought and literature, but also mathematically in a network structure and in, in you know like sort of a measurable, perturbable, uh, or you know, like testable way. Um, and that that is something that's so rare and so special about this exposition um, because you usually don't get those in the same book. Um, but but one of the things that I, I thought I thought about the like kind of academic style of like busybody to the hunter to the dancer and and I was curious if if it has to be in that order like what if you start off as a dancer dancer like what if you sort of build up knowledge while leaping between fields um like do you think it could work in academia or or does it have to go kind of the other way you got it you know build it up and and then I have a, a follow-up question of like whether different fields would have sort of optimal orders of curiosity network building processes like academic is busybody hunter or dancer but a doctor is more like hunter busybody and then like maybe when they're retired you know dancer or something and and like an entrepreneur maybe you know is more of that dancer at the beginning than a hunter than a busybody and so i um i and this isn't in the book but i'm i'm very curious on like whether you think it has like the order really aligns well with different disciplines and, and um, career pursuits. I would tackle just just the part about academia. I would say that um, I do think that that particular pathway from busybody to hunter to dancer is the most um, well trained in the academy. I think it is the one that literally shows up in, you know, writing 101 classes or maybe science methods classes um or beyond and <clears throat> so it is one i think that we see a lot of but and so but could you do it another way in academia absolutely might you get less uptake if you're more of a dancer first you know um as a as an academic yes i think you'll probably get a little bit less uptake in some cases i mean maybe in the arts field right it'll, it will be different but um so i think you, yeah you can arrange these in any way possible um but there are certain preferences that are stereotypical of uh community sciences etc yeah and i think i might also say that um it's you know it's always a question of what happens oh, okay maybe the the movement among those three is 
stereotypical um, when research goes according to plan, which it doesn't frequently, right? Um, so you might be uh, hunting for a while and you're like, you feel like you're ready to be a dancer, but um, you get stuck in the middle of the hunt. Um, and one of the things that can make a research project or an intellectual project stall for a long period of time is knowing what to do. Do I still, do I stay hunting? Um, do I switch to busybody? Do I switch to dancer? I don't know. I don't know which is best right now. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of uncertainty in these, these spots of stasis that, uh, that, you know, trouble or challenge the simple narrative that we move in, in sequence like this. I also think that, I mean, Perry, you've talked before about how there are fields outside of, maybe outside of science, um, where the busybody-like approach, perhaps, of telling stories in a more um, eclectic way is really highly valued among certain cultures of scholars or scholars from different cultures. Um, so that perhaps uh, what we feel, what is trained in us, particularly in science, is really specific to science and to science being trained this way. Yeah, and maybe just to Western science. So I, I was referring um, to indigenous research methods, which tend to be really storytelling forward. Um, and I think would rearrange this this kind of linearity of the busybody hunter dancer and likely have other styles uh, that, that are not captured by this particular kind of Western triptych. Yeah, and I love the way you're talking about it because flexibility is such a big theme throughout the book, like being able to change and move and question and, you know, like go from one area to another. And I, yeah, I think that that journey, that adaptation is um, kind of a big part of maybe what curious cause yeah, curiosity is at its core. But but at the end, you even you you add this bestiary, you know, um, which in um, medieval times was often employed as an allegory for morals and Christian traditions, or even using like you know fictional animals as a way of indicating dangerous or unknown ways on a map. Um, and I I felt like it was such a fascinating journey to think about like what other types of curiosity there might be. And for me, of course. It was the bee, um, not only because it starts with the Nietzsche quote that calls them uh, natured winged creatures and honey gatherers of the spirit. And I really just like being called a honey gatherer of the spirit. That was a nice touch. But it talks about how like the bees are foraging for their colonies and in doing so they make plant life possible. Um, they work, you say, they work communally among the gatherers and among the gatherers. And I love this line at the end, the bees curiosity is relational and respectful giving back as many nourishing opportunities as it takes. Mm. And I think that is just such a different way of, of maybe thinking about curiosity, not just as connecting knowledge, but really connecting culture and society and other nodes and infrastructures. And I, I was curious if you could give some examples uh, in your own life where that type of curiosity has been true or, or people that embody those sorts of like, not just knowledge network curiosities. Yeah, one of the examples that we return to repeatedly in the book is um, Gloria, Gloria Anzaldúa, who's a Chicana feminist writing in the 80s and 90s. And she's writing about the experience of being on the border of Mexico and the US growing up there and being an indigenous, or not an indigenous, uh, a mixed race kind of Latinx person and 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 just thinking about what does it mean to sit here in these spaces of betweenness socially um, and intellectually right with different traditions to draw on or being trained in um, what can one think here and one of the things that she argues is this space this space of being between is what teaches us the lesson of bridge building. And it's bridge building that guides for her every recommendation for coalition across groups. So she's very, you know, there's just a lot happening here. She's thinking always in a rooted way in her own experiences in place, but also in a connective way, again, between these traditions and knowledges and between peoples and what can we do together with the knowledge that we build. Any yeah. Yeah. Want to add anything? Uh yeah, just I guess maybe that um I think that it's an interesting style to bring with us into interdisciplinary work in science where we may be using a method from one area and applying it in a different area and it's important to do that in a way that 
returns as much benefit as it takes, um, and that it's it's not sort of um, you know, a, a an acquiring of this method to be used over here, but. It I think maybe Danny is a little bit stuck. Um, you're still on, Perry. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so this, I mean, this filters directly into the next thing I want to talk about, which is like so often in the book you're talking about questioning the norms, and um, in chapter six, you're talking about curiosity as a walk, and you quote Annie Dillard, and you're talking about walking, walking through nature, and and I love this line. She says, um, "The secret to seeing." is to sail on solar wind. Again, I just like imagining myself sailing on solar wind. Hone and spread your spirit till you think yourself are a sail, wetted, translucent, broadside to the nearest puff. And then you two add, to think with the fugitive freedoms of natural life requires the whispered attunements of the wind. Attunements stymied by the social habits and hierarchies that, are not, on that not only saturate cityscapes, but also constrain the very reach of nature itself. And one of the things like you, this is the theme throughout the book that we're sort of stuck in and we need to break out. But I kind of want to turn that on the head and ask like, does curiosity have to challenge the status quo? Um, to, to go to Danny's point, like there is some sort of like social responsibility of curiosity, I think is, is one of the things you were getting at is like, there is there is a relationship. There is an action and reaction to every move that we take. So. Like, what is the balance? Does it have to change, ch challenge the status quo? How do you know when you've gone too far? Um, how do you figure that out? Um, it's a great question. I think that um, curiosity, insofar as curiosity, we claim that curiosity is this capacity to build connections. And in building those connections, we can then build knowledge networks and social networks. Um, one could certainly build knowledge networks and social networks that aren't particularly, that simply replicate or, or just attach more things to inherited ways of viewing the world. And sometimes that is really useful. You know, we may have, um, speaking of Gloria Anzaldúa or somebody else, right, we may have uh, some really wonderful, rich lineages and traditions to draw on and to keep building on and to keep going that direction right and there's going to be others that we might be assessing you know what that we got to leave that behind you know in the past that needs to not be here in the present um and i think curiosity curiosity allows us both capacities and it's going to have to be other values kind of internal to us or shared among um, a social group that guide the practice of curiosity there yeah, and I also think that um, I like to think about the questions that we ask as as existing in some space where perhaps our knowledge that we currently have is is kind of this little ball here. And we, what we want to do is sometimes just push it out, just kind of work at the frontiers. That's asking new questions, but about something that we already know, right? And so it is just expanding. It's not necessarily questioning um, the entire structure. There's also an effort or can be an effort to fill in holes that exist inside of this ball that we have, because we have a sort of sparse understanding of even in the sectors of knowledge that we think we understand. And so filling in those holes also becomes important. Um, but in addition to sort of pushing out and pushing in, there's also the question of, do I need to leap to another space and really just completely reimagine or, or, or change the structure of the knowledge that I have? And I think each of those um, actions in that space are important. Yeah, I love that. I love, I love the way you're describing it. We're like, once you start thinking about curiosity as a structure, then you can build to the structure. You, you know, you can build onto it. You can subtract from it. You can change its form. You can change its function. You can start a whole other another structure colony over here, and then connect the two of them. It's like just a a, a different way of conceptualizing the knowledge that we're all like growing and and how we're putting it all together, which is is a pretty radical way of thinking about curiosity. I mean, it's the point of the book, but like it, for me, it's just this. Um, it's it's so fun to play around with it. It has a physical form and the beautiful like hand drawn uh, drawings through here that are are like I'm sitting at a coffee shop with you are a, an attest a testament to that. But um, okay, so we're in chapter six. There's an, there's another point that you make that uh, 
really spoke to me. And that was that all these great thinkers from Socrates to Plato to Walt Whitman needed to move to think. And I'm standing here, I'm not sitting. And at, like I was reading that chapter while walking around my room with post-it notes on the side. And I felt so seen by that comment and that discussion. And, um, you know, Waltman says, it's like, it's where I could go to think large thoughts found among great three trees. I actually think you guys uh, add the among great trees, but I wanna know why. Why do you think so many of us need to move to think? Is it about the movement or is it about the nature or the environment or like the strange allegory between like actually moving places and changing your brain? Like, what is it? Why do we need to move to think? Or at least some of us. I mean, I think, I think there is some beautiful resonance between the thoughts that need to move and then the body that's thinking them that needs to move. And, you know, that movement can be all kinds of, in all kinds of ways. So we do in that chapter emphasize that what by walking, we do not necessarily mean on two feet, right? Or two legs. Um, but there, there are, there are many different ways that are, that are incredibly inclusive of, of kind of negotiating space. Um, but there is, there is something not only resonant just between the walk, the thoughts that move and the body, the thinking that, that moves, but also how it is that the kind of those walks that one can take. One can take different kinds of walks in a, in a mind, moving through um, ideas slowly, circuitously, straightforwardly, urgently, right? And the same can be said of space. And we were just really drawn to this um, to this overlap, I think, between what philosophy has done in thinking, philosophies of walking has done in thinking this connection, and then what we can do with, with neuroscience. Danny. Yeah, so just thinking about, so um, as Perry is mentioning, there is a, a very strong history of trying to think through what walking does um, and how one thinks while walking. And there's a really nice literature that he canvases there. Um, but I think that we're also really interested in how in much of our curiosity, we are walking on a network that somebody else has already built. So we are asking questions and then we go to the encyclopedia or we go to a dictionary or we go online or we ask a friend. We're asking for a piece of information that we have a hunch exists, um, but that we don't have in our minds, but we think somebody else does, right? So we're walking on a path somebody else has laid down before us. They've discovered this thing, they've defined this concept, um, they've, uh, et cetera. So what we are doing is that what we are doing is that we are walking on an, on an existing network of knowledge when we are curious. Of course, there's also the place at which we end and there is no more knowledge after that. Um, and that's where new thinking happens and new experiments occur um, and we make new discoveries. So that's also possible, but much of our curiosity is also just walking on the paths that others have laid before. And that raises interesting questions of, um, you know, what are those paths that have been laid before? Are they we can celebrate. We can celebrate them. There's a lot to celebrate about them. But we can also ask whether there were um, whether there were inequities that determined which uh, connections were laid down that we walk on and and where they are. So we can sort of question as we walk whether whether we want to walk in that line or whether we want to um, spend time listening to other paths that maybe aren't as well trodden. I love that. I love the walking on a network that someone else built. Like, again, like, like I said at the beginning, this book is like, you got to sit down, you got to go for a walk, you got to come back to it. And like, okay, I've spent 10 minutes thinking about that one thought. I'm ready for the next sentence. It's it's so much about that. And, and this is a really nice segue, though I do want at some point here about like whether movers are, are more curious or embodies different types of curiosity, like the way that they move matches like physically move matches the types of curiosity that they embody. But um, we'll, we'll put a pin in that now because you you led to a really wonderful segue about even though we've never been particularly united on how we define curiosity or even really how we measure it, modern American culture assumes curiosity is a desirable thing and that we should be more curious and we should want our kids to be more curious. And that begs the question of what does curiosity look like in education? 
and who gets labeled as curious. And this is chapter eight for anybody following along. It's one of my favorite chapters. Well, I mean, some of your work has inspired chapter eight. So um, you, you know, you, you knew some of that was coming, but um, we're, we're really, really interested in going back to, you know, if we have a fundamental assumption that um, curiosity is the capacity to build connections that allow us to build knowledge networks. Um, and let's again say, let's assume that there are curiosity styles. Well, when we get into the classroom, that means that folks are going to be putting together knowledge and having inherited networks of knowledge or paths of knowledge that are really different from each other, depending on how they've grown up and depending on um, kind of what their neural structure is. And so I don't think that we don't think that educators are really yet up to the task of the immense diversity of ways of putting things, not only putting things together uh, that students um, carry with them in their minds, but also what kind of structures they're just carrying. Like, okay, I've connected two and two. How have you connected that? And how are you carrying that around as connected? It might be really different than how I'm doing it. Um, and we emphasize in particular um, neuroatypicalities, um, which again, I think is a, is a frontier of of education that we and pedagogy that we are not, we have not yet paid half enough attention to. Yeah, I love I love when you talk about like, you know, the, the curious kid is sort of labeled as the stereotypical, like asks a lot of questions, raises their hand, sits in the front, you know, ask these why questions. And and it's not there's a, there's different types of curiosity that aren't embodied those ways. And and you know, uh, particularly fond of, of quoting like or of, of measuring like curiosity and, and assume everyone is curious and figure out the ways in which they are exploring their networks and and building these structures um, in their mind. So um, really fantastic. I just got the little little ding to um, maybe wrap up towards the end. So we have plenty of time for the Q&A, which are coming in. Please uh, feel free to submit your questions. Um, but uh, back in 2018, Perry, you and your colleague, Arjun Shanker, um, were editors of a book called Curiosity Studies. Uh, and of course, Danny, you contributed a chapter to that book. And this book is sort of like a chapter by chapter example of the edge work that you discuss in Curious Minds, which is at a much higher level. It's like the curiosity of politics and of ecology and of neuroscience and of art and education. And it, it's sort of like a blueprint or textbook for the field of curiosity studies. And so I'm curious, ha, ha, ha. now that you've gone on this journey of this other book, like almost a metamorphosis of a book, what did you realize was missing? Like where, what would you add? Where does the field of curiosity studies go from here? Denny, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'm thinking, um, I mean, one of one of the sort of moments in writing Curious Minds that I think made me rethink curiosity and what I had thought about it previously was the moment when we realized that in order to have a, a, a mental model in our minds that is flexible and changeable and can respond to our environment and our experiences, we, we sometimes need to be able to break connections. Um, so in much of the book, we're talking about laying down connections, walking connections, where, you know, it's, it's a very generative, positive, cr constructive story. Um, and then at the end of the book, we say, oh, but you know, it's also sometimes really important to break connections. Um, and I think Th because that allows for us to restructure what we have in our minds. And sometimes that's critical for engaging in our futures. So I think that one of the things um, that I, I think of a lot now is where am I being curious to build something new? And when am I questioning things that I've taken for granted in my mind? Um, and so that's, I think, a, just a very different perspective that will stay with me. Um, as we move forward. I don't know, Perry. Yeah, I think curiosity studies was super exciting and I absolutely loved it. And it has really the germ of curious minds in, in Danny's chapter. Um, but uh, it was still largely disciplinarily siloed. Like there were some really nice resonances, but it, it was our aim to sort of represent, okay, here's the conversation in this field about curiosity, or this is the conversation that should be happening in this field about curiosity. And um, it's all a lot of 
prose also, um, although there's, there are some images, Danny, in your chapter, and actually Christy in yours as well. But but I think as we're writing Curious Minds, part of part of what I'm taking away from that for, for curiosity studies writ large is that it has to be more multimedia. Um, so, we, you know, we, in, we integrate uh, sketches, Danny sketches throughout the book, and then actual artistry from Puna Mystery throughout the book. We try, we do science, we do philosophy, we do more literary kind of whimsical writing, we do some humor and silliness. And I don't know, I think the a more experimental approach to how we write and what kind of tools and methods, like if that had been in every chapter of curiosity studies, then I think, you know, it might have been kind of similar, more similar to what Curious Minds is and where I want curiosity studies to go. But I think Curious Minds is pointing us more toward that. I want the pieces in the next curiosity studies collection to be harder to pinpoint what discipline they belong to mm -hmm. and to be more, um, more aware of the the multiple kinds of learners that are going to come to this text and be able to meet them in the ways that they will most likely resonate. Such a good response and so many questions I have, but there are questions that are coming in um, on this. I, I will say there's there's one quote that I pulled up here um, to, to respond to Danny's point is that you say, the work of thinking is one that escapes as much as, enga as, much as engagement of separation as much as connection. And I think that is a really kind of confusing but powerful thing, right? The whole book is about connection. Then you're like, but wait, but wait, actually the cracks, like actually the separation, actually the pulling apart is as much as the building together. And I think that's um, such a powerful thing. Um, Nell, do you want me to jump into some of these here? Um, I, either way, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I, I was thinking maybe we could start with, um, we have uh, Maria Donici's question here, which I think kind of loops in a tad bit, uh, Christy, to what you were asking. So um, her preface is, I collaborate with Italian public schools, um, three to 14 years old, as an external educator, we're trying to support teachers to encourage questions by children. Um, open questions that do not focus on a single right answer, but open to further questions as we'd like to promote curiosity, divergent thinking as main features of their learning path. But for teachers, it's difficult to shift their mind toward this direction. And with the question being, why do adults seem to put their own curiosity aside and seem to forget to be curious and how to support children in kind of opening their sense of inquiry? This is a fascinating question. And um, Susan Engel, who works a lot on curiosity and, and education, has repeatedly said um, one of the biggest things that we need to do in educational settings is reignite teachers' curiosity, uh, not just about their students, but about the subject and about the world and other subjects. I don't know. You know, the, they, there's so much focus on what do I need to do in the classroom? What do I need to teach? What do I need to prove that has happened in the classroom um, that, that, adults themselves are forgetting to kind of get lost in that open-ended question. And if they're not doing it, then they're not modeling it. Um, and I know Danny loves to talk about modeling, the power of modeling here. Yeah, well, modeling the kinds of um, curiosity that you can evince to students, I think is really important. I think about the people who have modeled curiosity for me in very different ways. And I think they are, sometimes they are mentors, sometimes they're colleagues, sometimes they're people who are much younger than me. And I say, oh, that's a great way of asking a question. Um, and just, I think it, I love being open to the experience of seeing that kind of curiosity in other individuals and then and then asking what part of that um, feels important perhaps um, to add to our experiences. I also want to ask the question of, in response to this of, you know, how much does our language have to ha have a role to play here? Our language, um, the, well, our, my language is English um, and I, our, English is mostly nouns um, and has a much smaller proportion of verbs. If you go to other languages, particularly from some indigenous cultures, they can have, you know, many more verbs than they have nouns. And I sometimes wonder whether it's actually whether the language being noun focused um, draws us towards this answer um, focused response or approach and also feeling that we understand something when we can catch the noun. Um, and I think that if we sort of turned that on its head and asked, where are the verbs and can we catch the verbs, we might have much more open-ended discussions. 
I love that. Um, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, and there are two questions here that I think can kind of be combined a little bit. So one uh, from an anonymous attendee who asks um, if the book addresses uh, the more negative perceptions of curiosity and that the word busybody generally has a negative connotation or the phrase curiosity killed the cat. Um, and then um, Jose Gordillo Martorell kind of tags onto that. And I think it's a little more sort of specific with it. Do you think that uh, when we are connecting dots in an unexpected way that um, there, there's sort of, I think he's asking kind of, is there kind of an inevitable kind of political side to it? That's sort of that you're challenging the status quo um, and uh, power, uh, people in positions of power trying to sort of neutralize new connections to avoid change. So I feel like one of what that first question maybe kind of flows into the other. So we do talk about curiosity killing the cat, and <laughs> um, and and this is in the bestiary actually at the end, the appendix. And I'm really influenced by this wonderful poem by Alistair Reed about it might just simply be titled "Curiosity," um, but he rewrites essentially the the line of cur of curiosity killed the cat by saying maybe the cat was just curious about what it would mean to die, mm -hmm. and. Um, and I find that so interesting because uh, I think especially the culture of which I'm a part um, tries not to think about dying, really, really, really tries not to hard, tries really hard to not get curious about death and to exclude the experiences of it um, in our own lives, um, in other people's lives, uh, and just quickly kind of push it away. Um, even our own deaths, which are always impending. Um, but maybe the, the cat was curious and kind of leading us to be curious also about dying and to reconcile with our own deaths and with other people's deaths and to have it be a more organic uh, thread in in our own culture and society. And that, to me, that just blows open the phrase, right? It, it, instead of curiosity, well, curiosity killed the cat. I feel like that always like stops the conversation, you know? And this this turning it on its head just like opens up so much. Like, let's talk about our relationship to dying. Um, I mean, that might sound morbid, but also like really rich and inviting and possibly joyous, uh, you know? So that's, that's a little bit of how we address that. Um, I don't know, Danny, if you wanna tackle the next question. Yeah, and I also think it's, well, just following up on that, it's important to think about dying in small ways too. Like maybe there are parts of yourself or your experience that have um, passed away or that are, are so far in the past um, that they're no longer part of who you feel you are now. And that there's there's a sort of, um, there's a, it's worth questioning that and trying to understand that. Um, and in other individuals, other individuals might change in a way that feels like they've died, even though they haven't died. Um, and that that's something that we can be curious about too. Anyway, but related to the next question about whether um, power tries to neutralize connections to avoid change, I would say that, um, I mean, the um, political factors of curiosity are much more um, in Perry's area of expertise than they are in mine. But from the book, I would say that there it's very possible for structures um, of power and privilege um, and structures of oppression to try to neutralize both new connections and to um, hold on to connections that are laid and not allow them to crack or break. So I think there's a there's again this two-sided coin of which connections are built and then which are broken and both connecting and breaking are, are important and can be policed um, so they can be for good or for ill. Thank you. We have a question from Bob Stone who asks, what are some of the neural correlates of curiosity, i.e. key brain structures and neural pathways? Yeah, that's such a great question. So the answer is that there are there's not a single, as far as we know as neuroscientists right now, there's not a single area for curiosity. It's not that there's one piece of the brain that lights up, oh, that means you're curious. Um, there's a whole constellation of regions that are activated um, when people are engaging in tasks that require curiosity. And there's also a, a whole set of pathways between them as well uh, that are being used. I think what's happening right now in neuroscience is trying to parse which pieces of that constellation are related to motivation or interest or um, 
the ability to make decisions about which way to walk um, mm -hmm. in your mind. Um, and so right now what's being done in the field is to sort of try to try to parse that very complicated network inside of your mind that's activated um, when you're curious. Oh, thank you. Cynthia Placha asks, what is, what is your first memory of being curious? Um, I'm, I would love to hear all three of your answers, but <laughs> I don't know who'd want to start. <laughs> then you should start with the Penn State example. I don't know the Penn State example, but maybe you do. But I From your, <laughs> your speech I, there, sorry. Oh, oh yes. When I was, oh yes. When I was very young, um, I was fascinated by um, how water moved in a toilet. Um, so, okay, very, very young, but trying to understand, I think it, you know, it was, it was fluid dynamics. I was just obsessed with fluid dynamics. Um, and I was, would flush the toilet over and over and over and over again, not because there was anything in it, but because I just wanted to see how the water moved. Yeah. And I was convinced that when I grew up, I would be a scientist who would figure out how water moves. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't do fluid dynamics now. I do thought dynamics instead. That's perfect. <laughs> Christy, how about you? I don't know. I, I like the first one is is what's hard. There were definitely ones later in my life. I was like a, a night owl, and again, the walking thing. I would just once the world was quiet and everyone else was asleep, I would go out and I would. I lived in grew up in rural Indiana, so just like fields everywhere, and I would um, watch the stars and I would just just imagine anything and wonder everything and and what i loved about and so i originally went into physics and astronomy and what i loved about the field was that it was immediately accessible but infinitely complex and every question i asked would lead to another question that i could ask you know like i could just dig deeper and i could never it would never stop and and to this day like that to me is the mark of a good field or a research question or something it's just like it's 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 immediately accessible. People can get it. People understand it. But and, and and there's poems written about it. You know, it's lovely. It's 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 enchanting. It's inspiring. But I can keep going um, and never run out of things to say. So I don't know if that was my first, but it's definitely one of the most poignant aspects of my curious walking childhood. Yeah, and my example is probably also not one of my first, um, but it's one of the first really imp imp ones that impressed was impressed on my mind um we grew up you know in a very natural environment and so we spent a lot of time outside you know and and we were very interactive with that world so like can we copy all the hoots of all the you know um flying creatures can we squish every um fruit that we see and what does it look like and how does it stain and what could we do with pine sap right which we tried to do all kinds of things with pine sap most of it unsuccessful <laughs> uh, so we explore we were really exploratory in that sense of the outside world but then beyond our property line was what we called the dump I think but it wasn't it wasn't a dump but it was like a, a trash yard behind a, somebody's house or something I don't think it was a house it was a building of some kind anyway we really wanted to know, like we wanted to go there and explore it, right? And it, our parents repeatedly said, you can't go there, right? They, I'm sure they were just like, morning, morning, <laughs> you're going to get hurt. You know, you cannot go there. And that just made it like so much more desirable. Right. Um, and we just had to go. So I think, I don't know if we even asked our parents permission, but we ended up walking. I remember Danny and I, we ended up walking over to this person's building, going in, finding, say, can we talk to the owner? The owner comes out and we say, can we play in your <laughs> trash yard? <laughs> He's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh -huh. And so we did. We we're like, well, we got permission from him. So uh, I have no idea what that says about us, about our interests, about curiosity, but that was a pretty, pretty memorable moment. Mm -hmm. Um, we have uh, Rob Schachter asks, uh, what have each of you learned about yourselves? Um, I presume kind of through the process of, of, of researching and writing the book, what have you each learned about yourselves that you believe is important for your personal or professional futures? Like, I guess it's this sort of, yeah, can you sort of see what, what the next sort of step would be if this is the book is sort of a scaffold for it? 
I think the biggest thing that I learned is that I absolutely love writing books with Perry um, and that this was the most enjoyable scholarly effort that I've ever been involved in. Um, so I think that's very important for my personal and professional future because I plan to do a lot more of it. <laughs> Yeah, and for me, I think it's also about the writing. So I do think that both of us found not only that we had to we had to find a different way of writing to actually bridge our fields, but and we found that way of writing in a in a way that was far more um, kind of flexible, creative, uh, just whimsical, rich, richly poetic. Um, all the things that we're not supposed to necessarily be using in our respective writing careers. <laughs> um, and so for me, it's, it's, yeah, just the fruits of working cross-disciplinarily and listening to what the concepts themselves need from your writing rather than forcing them into how it is you already write. I'm going to be stewing on that for a while. That's yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great way to put that. Um, and our, our last question is going to be from Ronald Epp, who asks, might you elaborate on a strategy that might be adopted to break the disciplinary and social barriers or boundaries that often choke off curiosity? Well, one is this cross-disciplinary work, first of all, um, which I know all three of us are busy doing <laughs> anyway. That's one strategy. Probably also working outside of universities in, in deep relationship to communities and to the people that we love and care about um, demands something different of our work uh, and, and, and asks that it leave its own uh, comfort zones. And we actually just, as I was reading that one, we had one last one come in and I were the sort of right at time, but it might be a good way to wrap us up. Uh, David Buck asking, do you have suggestions on practical steps for people to take to increase their curiosity. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that we, um, I think one way that you can support your curiosity um, is just to spend more time noticing what kind of curiosity you have. I think there's a lot of room for self-understanding um, that we try to um, focus on in the book is that it's, you know, it's possible that the kind of curiosity that you have isn't the one that has been um, put up on a pedestal in the um, earlier parts of your life. Uh, but I think, and so maybe you feel that your curiosity is lower or decreased or, or less than someone else's. But in fact, it may be that you have a different style of curiosity. And if you can understand that style in yourself, um, then you can create um, context in which it will flourish. Um, and so I guess maybe the second part of the answer I would add is um, being open to new experiences and then testing in yourself whether that felt like it was supportive of your curiosity or not supportive of your curiosity and and recognizing and, and assessing as you go. Um, so those are the two things that I would I would raise. One is openness to experience and the second one is sort of being open to self-understanding. And I'm going to add because they can't say it, but I can, is that like, if you're reading this book, <laughs> we'll take you on a journey of self-realization for curiosity, because it's just peppered with questions where you have to say like, why do I do this? Is this the way that I should do it? You know, do I need to be more brave, braver, bold, uh, to break down those barriers, to be interdisciplinary, to do the things? Um, it's, that's, that's my two cents is that you can't not read through this and not question it. You won't get past like page 12. <laughs> Uh, perfect. And I, actually, yeah. <laughs> and I just reposted the link in the chat to um, purchase Curious Minds, The Power of Connection from harvard.com. Um, thanks uh, to all of you uh, joining us on the Zoom from wherever you may be. Thanks for listening in on your, your lunch hour or whenever you are. Um, and uh, Danny, Perry, and Christy, thank you so much for this delightful conversation what a great way to spend a friday <laughs> yeah. thank you so much for having us thank you and special thanks christy for joining yes. us thank, thank you. you this was awesome excellent uh so um yeah everyone have a have a great weekend and um happy reading be safe and well thanks so much thanks so much to the three of you again Bye. thank you